Well, we at CUNY are accustomed to uh, diverse audiences. I think this uh, one takes the cake, and uh, I hope I can ri rise to the uh, challenge of it. So um, my role today is, as uh, was indicated by Dr. Hu, to talk not science primarily, although I am going to sneak a little bit in, um, but to talk about Fred Nader as a colleague, and I've also indicated mentor because when I came in 1985, um, you know, I was an associate professor, but newly associate, and, and Fred was certainly one of my senior colleagues, even though he was not that much older. So, um, and much of what I'm gonna say um, will, overlap and I think resonate, I would even say, um, with things that have been said already in the context of the scientific presentations. But what I wanna try to do a little bit differently is to particularize the comments to the College of Staten Island, where as indicated, I spent 22 years of my professional life. And I wanna take you through a number of uh, roles and a trajectory of time um, of 30 years in total to indicate some of the changing roles um, that Fred and I have had with respect to one another and that would be in the context of the college, the very local and also in CUNY and, and, and it includes some of our scientific relationships um, really quite prominently. So. Um, I've put a little College of Staten Island there to indicate that affiliation as well as my present affiliation as City College. Um, so I've been gone from CSI for eight years, but of course I'm part of CUNY and so the relationships remain and I would have to say they are sweeter sometimes uh, when they're not every day and they are not every day. Um, and I didn't mean that really as a joke, but okay. So the way I've organized this, um, as I've indicated, is to talk about different roles and relationships, and some of these have been mentioned by others, but I'm gonna say them in my own way. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the environment at the college when I first arrived, when Fred was just taking over as chair of the chemistry department, which I think he, a position he held for about a decade, I believe. And I want to talk about him as a mentor to me as a faculty member, and by implication, others as faculty members, but also as a mentor to trainees, and I will embarrass a few of them by showing pictures. And, uh, and many of them are here today, which is also very important, I think, to Fred and, and to me and to all of us who have helped to train them and launch them. Um, and I'm gonna talk about Fred's science in the context of Fred's role as an exemplar and an inspiration um, for me and, uh, and, and a sometime partner because we did work together on a few projects, um, at least one of which was mentioned today. Um, and then I wanna finish by talking about Fred again as a leader, but in a different context, um, not as I first met him uh, in his role as chair of the chemistry department, but in his many other roles, which he took on um, in addition to, and while maintaining in robust form, his scientific activities. And that in itself, I think, is a, is a tremendous and miraculous, I would even say, achievement. So, um, so that's where we're going, and I'll try to keep on time because I know we, we are running a little bit um, late. Okay, so um, I wanna say a little something about um, my recruitment to uh, the college. Some of you here may recall that um, the department was looking for 
I think, two roles. They were looking for a polymer chemist because that had been the strength and still is a, a major strength of the department and a focus area. And they were looking for uh, an NMR spectroscopist, particularly to add strength in solid state NMR. Um, I am the latter, I am not the former. And so that meant that the college and the department um, were really taking a chance on me in terms of what I might add to the department and how I would fit in the department. And I think that um, Fred's role in this was, as I see it, to uh, consult a trusted collaborator elsewhere in CUNY and somehow to see some promise in the different kind of polymer, particularly biopolymer focus, it was proteins at the time, um, that I represented that might complement and augment the department. And I would have to say that he really was taking a chance on me, and he must have seen something that I have to say I did not see at the time. Um, and he and others took a chance on me um, and hired me. And, um, and it was also a time that was difficult for me, having come from a very different environment at Amherst College, a private elite school, and coming here to CUNY and not knowing what or who I would encounter and, uh, and really needing um, to figure out myself how I would fit and how I would grow professionally. And so I think it was in some respects a leap of, of faith um, despite the record that I presented, but it was a, a leap of faith as to whether this would work at all. And, and Fred, as the new chair, um, was arguably one of the leaders, um, along with Albert Levine, um, who was the outgoing chair, in taking that leap. Um, I want to say something about what I encountered and how what Fred's role uh, in that environment was when I arrived. It's what I uh, like to call a three-site shuffle and I have indicated that. I hope you can see these uh, little apples. Um, so we were the College of Staten Island by that time. We had been for about a decade, but um, we were still in two locations, and in fact, we were in three locations, this being the old site of the CUNY Graduate Center, um, this being the St. George campus, and this being the Sunnyside campus. And what that meant for me arriving was that we had about, I think, 16 faculty members, roughly equally distributed between the community college campus and um, the Richmond College campus. So two days a week, I would arrive for an 8 o'clock class in this location and teach freshman chemistry uh, for an hour or two, um, after which I would drive over here where all of the parking spots were taken in the underground garage and you had to um, dodge the concrete um, obstructions and somehow find a place. And then I would go to my lab because my lab was here. And in that same semester, in addition to teaching general chemistry over here and then trying to get my lab going over here, um, half of that semester I would teach here polymer chemistry, which as I indicated, I knew very little about. So, um, so it was quite an adjustment. And the thing that was notable um, with respect to Fred and this environment was, first of all, that he was leading the department, the whole department. And I think he saw his role in terms of um, merging and complementing and making the whole thing work when in fact this is what we had. We had two cultures, not humanities and sciences, but in among the sciences we had a bunch of faculty uh, who had chosen careers as community college faculty members teaching 
primarily or exclusively. Um, and then we had a bunch of faculty who were very committed to doing research in polymer chemistry and also training at the higher levels. And so arguably, um, that was a two-culture situation. And the trick, which took a lot of time and a lot of effort and um, some tact to merge these two groups and to try to get them to function as a unit that was both complementary and synergistic. And I'm not going to claim that it worked perfectly, but what I do want to say is that Fred took that role very seriously to build that department into a, a well-functioning unit of mutual respect and uh, people trying to help each other. And it, it I would be remiss if I did not say that it was also a challenge with respect to the students because we had a highly heterogeneous um, student body um, between the community college students who in many cases didn't know if they were going to go any further and were not really thinking about that. And then we had students at Richmond College who had come from other CUNY campuses and, um, and were motivated differently. And then we had PhD students and postdocs and the whole gamut. And so that, I would say, is a, is a challenging environment. And as Bill Frist alluded to, it is still a challenging environment on a single campus, but I think you can imagine that it was a tough game to play um, in this uh, bifurcated or trifurcated, whatever, um, environment. And so, um, so I just want to say that um, Fred was the first leader that I encountered to make uh, the attempt and the very decided and long-term attempt um, to make this work. Um, I want to say something at this point about Fred as a colleague, but really as a mentor, because um, as I said earlier, my uh, scientific background, my research background, was not in the mainstream of the department of primarily people doing polymer synthesis and characterization. That's not my background. I'm a physical chemist. Um, and my biochemical and biophysical background was pretty fresh at the time I came to the college. I had not been doing this kind of work very long. And so um, Fred, as a mentor, as others have mentioned, um, one of the things that um, he was very firm about was that regardless of the environment that we could do not just good science but excellent science in our environment and that even though the rooms might be cold and the labs might be small that we could have good ideas and bring them to fruition and that we could do high-end science um, in our environment if we kept our focus and kept our wits about ourselves and spoke to one another often and sometimes loudly and you know whatever was going on and um, and I think for me, I was probably the first faculty member in that department who had a research program, a funded research program. And one of the things that, uh, one of the groups of things that Fred did um, in support of me, um, not just as, a, as the women, woman faculty member doing this kind of work, was to, um, promote me and cajole me into applying for Research Career Development Award, which at that time um, you had to have an R01 grant and this and that and the other, and then you had to get this other thing. And he had had this, and this was not a usual thing for the College of Staten Island, and he said, well, I think you can do this. Why don't you try to do this? And I mentioned the Career Award, which came after me, but by implication, because um, this encouragement of excellence, I think, is something that um, 
he has promoted um, with many, many people. If he feels that you can do it, he will say to you, why don't you try this bigger thing, this higher thing? And, um, and that, I think, also applied much later on um, uh, in terms of the distinguished, distinguished professorship. Now, I would say that one of the things that I learned that he may not be aware of is that when Fred was being nominated as distinguished professor, um, the time that he prevailed, uh, I was in charge of his candidacy. And I thought, well, I don't know, how does this work? And I had to learn um, how to make this work, but I also learned what the appropriate standard of excellence was. And that was a little bit daunting for me to see what people were saying about Fred and that, well, this is, this is you gotta walk, walk on water. What do we gotta do? And it was really an inspiration to me to, again, see what could be done in our environment um, if you put your mind to it and, and, and so on. And so some years later, when, when Fred and I spoke about my trying to get that appointment, I knew what I had to do, and it was um, uh, a high, you know, a, a big hill to climb, but I knew what the appropriate standard was, and that was really quite important. Um, one of the things that he said to me during that time that stuck with me is, you know, you have to write a document on what, why you should get this appointment. And I had written up something, and there was lots of stuff on it, and this and that and the other. And he said, no, no, no. Don't explain what you did. Tell them what you accomplished. What was the significance of your work? And I was like, duh. But uh, this was really important because it's so easy to uh, miss the forest, you know, just miss the forest for the trees. And, um, and one of the things that I could always depend on Fred for was not just to set the standard, but if I would come in with some wrong-headed idea or some emphasis that just didn't make sense, he would just stop and redirect me. And it was always constructive. It was never loud and screamy, it was, but, it, but once he would say it, it was obvious. And I think that's a skill to be able to do that in a way in which the person on the other end realizes that, um, you know, they've been wrong and now, and now this is the obvious right thing to do. So, um, so that's important. Um, the other thing that I put here, um, that takes me back to where we started at the college was that there was a, a conventional wisdom, which I think was not wisdom at all, which was that either you could be good at teaching or you could be good at research, and you could not do both. And I think all of us who work in the academic environment know that there is a tension and a conflict in terms of time between those two functions or any two functions. But the, the insight that Fred had and that he um, espoused very vocally was that it was not a trade-off. You don't have you know, a, a fixed amount of excellence in yourself that you have to partition, and that if you do teaching well, you won't do research well, and vice versa, that that's a little bit ridiculous. And that you can um, do really well at both, and moreover, that they feed on each other. And that was something that I have really grown into with time, but that I would say was introduced to me by Fred Nader um, in the context of those early days um, at the College of Staten Island, um, you know, on the St. George campus where I spent most of my time, and that um, you don't need 
to always make a choice that you can do well at both of those. Um, okay, so this is the mildly embarrassing picture that I promised Fred. Uh, so this section has to do with mentorship, but not faculty to faculty, but rather the mentorship that we think of more customarily in terms of training students. And um, I think the insight that I, the types of insights that I got from Fred um, had to do with approach. And I think someone else referred to the uh, idea that when you train um, students, even at a given level, you have to treat them as individuals. They're all different. You have to draw out their strengths and address their weaknesses and do it simultaneously and do it differently each day and do it differently with each person. And I think uh, I've sort of written nudge, cajole, and so on. But I think it applies at all levels and, um, and it's something that I really got to see uh, every day, uh, particularly when I had an office um, near Fred's, but even before then. And it's something that um, uh, really has stuck with me as, as, a, as something that I'm still learning to do. Um, one of the things that has been referred to by some of um, Fred's collaborators that I will reinforce here is that um, in terms of training uh, fledgling scientists, as I'll call them, um, he really believes in stretching them intellectually, that you don't say, well, this, this person can only do this much. No, they can, they can do double that. They can do triple that. They don't know what they can do yet. And so um, that's really been an important theme um, to set the bar high and let people rise up to it and above it. Um, we've all seen today, this has really been a, a beautiful illustration of the power of partnerships. Um, I put a star here to remind myself that some of those partnerships um, that Fred has fostered among his trainees have resulted in marriages. Uh, I think two undergraduates, uh, uh, Jackie and I forgot his name, um, but that was one marriage. There was uh, one of your, uh, one of Fred's uh, uh, PhD students married one of my postdocs. So partnerships of all types, uh, very rich, and, uh, and really uh, an empowerment of people in many different kinds of careers. And many of those people are back here today in their, in their glory, and it's really great um, to see that. So this particular picture um, is from the PhD thesis defense in, of my student, Yan He, um, who is now a senior scientist at Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, I believe that both of these young ladies are in the audience. Lana Rabinowitz, who was a, an honors college student um, uh, who uh, went on to medical school. Katrina Carocia. I'll call her, but Facciolo, uh, uh, who was a PhD student, and I had the pleasure of teaching her um, PhD level molecular biophysics. So these were the two that I found on the web, um, and you'll be hearing from Leah Cohen later, so I didn't put her picture up here, but just to illustrate um, the many examples. Okay, so, um, I, I'm not supposed to be talking science in this section, but I've snuck a little bit in to illustrate um, a couple of things about Fred's role, um, not only as an exemplar and an inspiration, but to illustrate something about how the two of us functioned as intellectual partners and still do on occasion. And as I indicated, um, I'm not a polymer chemist. I'm not a peptide chemist. I did do a, a rotation with Mary Goodman and, and thought very seriously of working with him as, as a PhD student, but um, that's not my background. 
And one of the things that, um, that I learned from Fred um, that panned out into a couple of projects that we did together was the power of being in the same room. And I mean that both literally and figuratively in that um, having conversations, even when they start off um, as very in passing, not so serious, if you have someone whom you see all the time and you're talking about, you know, what was the statement? I'm a mind waiting for data. Uh, if you have that attitude, you're going to be sharing what you learn and what you're confused about. And if you do that often enough, every so often, you're going to find something where you can help each other or redirect each other. And in our particular case, um, I've pulled a couple of examples. I think there are three in total, not, not a lot over the years, but, um, but they've been very significant to me. So one of these um, in the mid-90s um, was a study of um, fungal cell walls. And it was something that we just kind of went and tried to do. And I mention it because it was a, a problem where um, Fred and Jeff wanted to find out something that could not be done by the more traditional um, techniques. And it could not be done by solution NMR. But it was something we could try to do by solid state NMR. And it wasn't strictly solids. It was kind of mushy solids, wet things that were not so well studied at the time. And it was just something we went and tried and tried to figure out what to do with it and what kind of information we could get. Now, it turns out that um, I had occasion to look again at this paper because through another set of chance overlap circumstances, I ran into Peter Lipke, who's here in the audience, at a different kind of meeting. And we started talking and we started working on something that may or may not pan out, but it took me back to this partnership that was initiated by Fred Nader. Um, the second example that I picked uh, is a little more on topic um, because it dealt with alpha factor, um, the uh, peptide hormone that many of you have been hearing about today, and, and it has a uh, uh, you know, it's more in the mainstream of Fred and Jeff's work for a fair bit of time. It was actually a collaboration also with Joel Garbo, um, my longtime collaborator who had been at Monsanto and is now at WashU St. Louis. And um, the reason I mention it is because this was, again, an example where um, there was interest in conformational states, structural biology information, but in solid state. And so along with Bor Boris Arshava, who is here in the audience, um, we undertook what turned out to be a, a much larger study than we anticipated to see if we could get conformational information for this peptide um, in, uh, in, in the solid state. And the one sentence answer to it is that we could get information, but that the peptide was not just sitting around waiting us for us to take a picture. In fact, it was, under, it was in many different conformations, and we had to figure out what they were and how they interchanged and so on and so forth. And so it was a, a, a study that became more interesting, but also a little bit vexing. Um, the final one I'm going to mention um, is one that has not yet come to fruition, but it relates to some of the work that Oliver Zerbe presented um, in the last session, and that is the issue of how do we look at fragments, transmembrane fragments, in this case it was TM1, TM2, um, of GPCR proteins. And the bottom line here is that these are tough problems, which we found out. And the, it fits the theme, not just of here are some problems that maybe a solid state NMR person can help out with, but that that may not be enough. And that you have to try a, a, a method, and Leah Cohen tried many, many <laughs> methods, um, of 
how do you prepare that sample? And once you prepare it, what are the spectra going to look like? And what if you get beautiful spectra, but the system is not very relevant physiologically? So what do you do next? And this is a, 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 a problem that we approached in, um, in membrane memetics, including isotropically tumbling bicells. We approached it in solid state, which is the carbon-carbon correlation spectrum that you see here. We tried many, many things. And we did not achieve our goals, but I would hope that this story is not finished yet. So um, hopefully it has another chapter. Um, OK, so just to wrap up, um, I'm going to give my, my Nader rules. I don't know. Um, whatever. Uh, I want to say something about, as an overview, um, looking, sort of pulling back from the specific Department of Chemistry perspective to some of Fred's roles and in our interactions and lessons I've learned over a period of time. And I grouped them sort of as three because, as you know, Fred was Dean of Science for a period um, in the 90s, and he's been provost very recently, but throughout He's been an advocate and a confirmed and fervent advocate, I would say, for the College of Staten Island. And um, I would say it's not an overstatement that Fred loves this place and that he believes in it and believes in its potential. And, and he's, he made the affirmative choice to live in this community that both this Willowbrook community and this College of Staten Island community with all of its richness um, as well as its occasional frustrations. And, um, and so this is a choice that he made. And it's always been informed by a principle of aiming high. And I've, I've listed a number of examples thinking of his various roles. So that could be polymer chemistry, it could be neuroscience where he played a leadership role. Uh, sometimes it's been applied math. That more recently it's been nursing, physical therapy, business, education. All of these areas where excellence is there to be developed and come um, to flower. And that I think that's always been um, Fred's role and contribution. Um, others have mentioned that Fred is outspoken. Fred is outspoken. He plays straight. He doesn't play games. He, I think, tries to build consensus if possible. He always voices skepticism, and he does it in a constructive, if firm, way. If necessary, he will confront disagreements. He does not shirk um, that responsibility. Um, but always he will take the ethical high road. And that's a lesson that I sometimes needed to learn and, um, and, that I, and that we all need to learn and continue to learn. But that's always been um, consistent with Fred. Um, whenever I have interacted with Fred in a, in a sort of leadership role, I have found that whatever the discussion is, he will hang back and say nothing at the beginning, and then when he speaks, there's something original and a contribution that everybody says, oh yeah, that's, that's right, that's the thing. And it's a lesson that um, is very important to learn, to not always be the first, sometimes better to listen and then be the last, and to always be optimistic. And so this is Fred and me and my husband, Abe Malls, who's in the audience, um, being optimistic at graduation um, a couple years ago. So that's kind of all I will say and leave you with this um, progression. Um, thank, thanks to uh, the local cameraman and the uh, World Wide Web. And uh, with that, I will uh, finish off and say, Thank you for being you. <laughs>